uh, tonight, our, our guest is Talif Olson. Um, has anybody met Talif before? Okay, well this is going to be good. Um, you won't find a more energetic or, or uh, passionate speaker. And Talf comes from a commercial fishing background, as well as like, you've done treasure hunting too? And restaurant. And restaurant. So a pretty diverse background. Um, I remember when I started the job, it was uh, just the time when muscle rafting had started within the state. Talif was right there at that forefront. Uh, he founded the company um, whose brand is Bangs Island Muscles. Um, and we heard from Matt Moretti earlier, so uh, Toff is the, the founder of that company. He founded Ocean Approved, which was the, the first kelp farm in the United States, I think. Yes. Yep. Um, and his company presently he's co-founded is Ocean's Bounce. Um, and he's going to talk with us about uh, production um, of seaweeds. But in case you don't touch on it, Toff, I want you to make sure that you ask him about food. Because every time I hear Toff talk, there's a new spectacular picture of some way to use seaweeds in, in seafood together. Um, and I've just always been impressed with you experimenting in the kitchen. Um, and it sounds like a delicious place to be. So, uh, Talif, please. Hi, I'm Talif Olson, as Dana said. A real diverse background. I've commercial fished on and off all my life in a lot of fisheries from Maine. Moved to uh, Florida with my family in 1970 and fished Florida, fished the Gulf of Mexico. Also did a lot of, spent a lot of time all around the world doing marine salvage, uh, treasure hunter, looking for old shipwrecks. Actually met with a little bit of success. And then I actually owned a restaurant for a while up in Bar Harbor. So combining those three elements, it really, I became a perfect candidate for aquaculture. You've got to be innovated, innovative. You've got to come up with new foods if you're first in. When I first started with the Bangs Island mussels, I couldn't, I couldn't sell them, and I couldn't all, all, and I couldn't sell them all for the price that they should sell at. Now they can't grow enough rope-grown mussels in Maine. I don't think any company can keep up with the demand right now. Seaweed was even a little further behind. I started talking to Shep Earhart from Maine Coast Sea Vegetables as early as '81, '82, when I had the restaurant about doing something with seaweed, and the demographics just weren't there. We were just starting to get sushi bars in the United States. People were just starting to think about seaweed. But other than the vegetarians and the macrobiotics, it really was not a staple in anyone's diet. The only really big company at that time was FMC, who uh, pull out the uh, carrageenans. And they opened up, I think it was 1934 that they started, and through 1970, they harvested all their seaweeds right up here in Maine, Nova Scotia, and even down to Massachusetts. Well, in 1970, they moved it offshore, and they started farming down in the Philippines and created a million jobs. Where I'm going with this, of course, is that now we're finally seeing the full circle and we're actually being able to bring some of these jobs back here and grow a lot of these products here. There was a lot of groundwork that had to be done first. When I started the mussels and then the seaweed company, I couldn't go to the mussel farming store. I had to look at stuff from Europe. I had to look at stuff from New Zealand. I had to look at stuff uh, from all over the world and then find out something and combine it and make it work here. Seaweed was kind of the same thing. They're farming seaweed on a major scale in China already. Uh, they're doing 15 million metric tons a year in China. Uh, they pretty much control the industry right now. Probably 97, 98 percent of the overall kelp food market comes out of China. They grow that much. I see a lot of reasons for doing that here at home instead. We know what's in our waters. If you Google where they farm the seaweed in China, it would be Oh, like putting it right, right in New York Harbor, or right in one of the dirtiest harbors you could find in the United States. Luckily, seaweed, like a lot of other farm things, it can uptake the heavy metals, but in general, it doesn't collect the baddies. It's no different. A lot of the fertilizer running downhill is just food. It's just a plant. It's you know, growing from the sunshine and from the nutrients, which are just nitrogen, like we'd actually put on a real crop, or a regular crop. But, so we've got the unique topography here with 3,000 miles of coastline, and a lot of the fishing fleet that actually sits idle in the winter time. I know it seems funny now, when I started talking about this a decade or more ago, we were desperate for jobs. Right now, the job market is totally saturated, but that doesn't mean the job market at home is saturated. We have all these outlying communities, and I can't, imagine, not, I can't help but imagine several of you live in those, and if you want a job in your community, then you do have to find it, and you do have to go to the ocean. The alternative is to move someplace else to find a job, and that's not an alternative that all of us want. When you get into aquaculture, 
the first couple things you have to worry about is location, where your site is going to be, but you also have to have a seed source, and that's the first thing they're going to ask you. Uh, some of you are already farming, I guess, or, and a lot of you are doing wild, but the first thing the DMR is going to want to know is seed source. The first thing I did with Ocean's Balance when we moved into the, and started the first farm here in the United States of seaweed for human consumption was, was to develop the seed technology. We actually got to the point where we could take the wild source tissue, which is a reproductive tissue, induce it to release the spores on demand in a lab, and hold it in controlled conditions for a month with light, food, and temperature before we move it out into the ocean where it does its thing all by itself. The entire eastern seaboard of the United States is considered nitrogen impaired. Nitrogen is the fertilizer we put on our crops. We've got plenty out there. I was out harvesting seaweed on a bed one day and the warden pulls up and he goes, what are you doing? I was harvesting rockweed and I was harvesting it on a smaller scale and you'll see later on that part of what I do is experiment with new food products. But I looked at him and smiled and said, hey, we're recycling the fertilizer that these guys dumped on that lawn up there. Looks over at this big green expanse of lawn and he goes, oh. Could you explain that? We're taking up the nitrogen that's running off. And it's, it's so the seaweed farming is really a win, win, win. It's a fairly low cost to get started in. It's fairly simple to get the seed right now. Uh, there are sources. Individuals probably wouldn't want to all start their seed farms. This is actually sugar kelp, and this is what is the dominant crop being farmed right now. We have started uh, farming a, a variant of this, which is ribbon kelp or skinny kelp. It really doesn't even have a name yet. Uh, they're very closely related and they grow in the exact same conditions on the farm. So they're both real good crops. Putting them in the ocean is real simple. After we get the spores to release, we put this piece of PVC with a couple hundred feet of string on it into a, query, or into a dark tube, settling tube overnight. And the spores actually swim to the string and then adhere to the substrate. It was funny, the first time that we got our spores to release. We were at the lab down in GMRI working under a grant, and our spores started swimming away under the microscope. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, and I'm looking at these spores going, I'm growing a plant. How can, how can these spores be swimming? And the, there's three, um, the, Ilaria, the um, laminaria species, or strain of kelps, the, the uh, spores all swim. They're mobile, and so they can actually go to a preferable substrate. Uh, it is different with some of the other kelps, like the fucoids, and we'll get into that later. But so after you've held it for a month or so under ideal conditions in the lab, you see how nice and even the brown is on that string. You just hook your, you throw your mooring in the water, you attach to the mooring, you, you line to the mooring, and with the string tied through it and the line going through the piece of BBC, you just back down in the boat and the string spirals out around that line. I can see it a 400 foot LPA in about 20 minutes. That includes dropping the moorings. And I'm going to get into the moorings in a minute because that was one of the big, became a big issue in the early stages. This is what it looks like after four or five or six months. The amount of volume we can grow in a winter is unbelievable. We see gross weights of a, up to 10 pounds a foot. It can vary from place to place. And everybody gets excited when they hear 10 pounds a foot. But that includes everything. You're talking the hold fast. You're talking the stipes, the blades. And a lot of times on, out on the very tips, you'll have reproductive tissue or less than prime tissue. And that can make a big difference on the quality of the kelp. So you don't yield necessarily 10 pounds of perfect food kelp. Three or four pounds a foot would be a, you know, probably more average yield at this point. And the aftermarket or the secondary buying market right now, is uh, the price is a dollar a pound. So there's actually a pretty good price going for them. Even at uh, three or four pounds a foot, you're going to see a good return on your farms even in the first year. This is what you can grow in about seven months. That piece of kelp is about 15 feet long. And all we did was put the rig in the water and let it grow. That young lady and I, Cal Colleen, on this barge one day, harvested 16,000 pounds, just the two of us. That was actually part of a fuel experiment that we were doing with BAL Labs, DuPont, and Stat Oil under an ARPA grant. And so we were just seeing, we are growing it strictly for the volume, that particular farm. But two of us on this little bitty barge with just two davies and hand crank trailer, old trailer winch like you'd use, we're able to harvest that much. And so the volume's there. We know we have plenty of you know, beautiful places. And this is actually a good time to talk about that a little bit. Getting the sites is a key issue. And you see the shoreline back here. This site is placed well out of all navigational areas. 
Uh, you all know if you work on the water that some areas are more heavily fished for lobster than others. So that's one of the first things you're going to do is go look and try to avoid a heavily lobstered area. You're not going to get that lease anyways unless it's a strictly seasonal area, which there are plenty of. And with the lemon areas, that's part of the beauty of it. It is counter-cyclical to the lobster industry, which for this particular crop opens up a lot of coastline. And it also opens up coastline that's close to home, which wintertime travel on the water, especially if you're working with light gear, can really be, a di you know, can be difficult and can be dangerous. The real key when I put that first farm in was to develop new product lines. I love dried seaweed, and, but as a chef, I've even been guilty of having it in the cupboard and, well, it doesn't fit what I'm cooking tonight. So I came up with the idea of fresh frozen. Just simply blanch it, freeze it, think Charlie's bird's eye, and away you go. You've got a whole new product line. And that opened up a lot of doors. This was back 2008, 2009. I actually put the first wild product of that type on the market in 2002, 2003, and it was that long before I was able really to control my farming conditions and actually have a farm crop like this that we could then move into that, um, into that stream of raw materials. And so, that, so, it's, so even though we had a beautiful product, you still have to get the market used to it and people don't know what it is. Little things that you don't think of at first when you're introducing a new product. Do you put it with the fish or do you put it with the frozen veggies? You put it with the frozen veggies and you've got the most expensive product on the shelf. You put it with the frozen fish, well the price point is real good, but you just lost all your vegetarians and macrobiotics. They aren't going over there to buy it. And that's a big segment of your market. These are little things you might not think about initially when you're ramping up. And on the ramp up, that's why it's good to have an off-taking company that will off-take. Then you can play around locally with new products if you like. You can make pickles out of kelp. You can make so many things out of the seaweed, so many different dishes. It's ridiculous. Things like lobster benedict. You can put the, we have a kelp puree you put in the hollandaise sauce and the little rounds on top of there, those are just a blanched stipes. The stipes are actually still underutilized when I talked about not getting paid necessarily 10 pounds a foot. The stipes actually the, can hold, uh, run as much as one or two pounds a foot and that adds up. And so we're working on marketable products with the stipes. And we love thinking outside of the box. When, when people are sitting there at brunch and you, sh you show them an Eggs Benedict, Last thing they're expecting in it is seaweed in this country, but that's starting to change. Another key aspect to seaweed is, you can see there's not a ton of seaweed there. You don't need a ton of seaweed each sitting. It's really dense, it's really nutritious, it's really high in fiber. The dietary fat, and I'll save that for the desserts, is a good story about the dietary, uh, the fiber and fat. But the trick is to learn how to eat it the way they have in Asia for millennia, the way they have in Europe for millennia and centuries. And that's start incorporating it on a regular basis in your diet by getting it into dishes you're already comfortable with using. And that's what we did with the frozen. Who doesn't like a nice smoothie? And you want to talk about an easy way to get it into your kids' diets. But if, when you get it into your kids' diet, the first thing you're boosting is iodine, which we are all, or not all of us, but 50% of the people in this country are iodine deficient. Very little of our food provides the iodine you need. And so this is a great source of it. With the talk here, I'm just going to be giving a real general overview. It'll last about a half hour. And then on any of these issues or different facets of it, we can go into detail, whether it be the nutrition, whether it be the growing, the nursery, we can move into all of that uh, after we finish the talk. Seaweed salad. The seaweed salad that people have been eating in this country now for the last three decades in sushi bars, most of it's, it's crap. It's got preservatives in it. It's got food colorings in it. It's mostly, uh, it's mostly a uh, filler that it's made actually from, an egg, uh, from seaweed powder, agar agar, but they roll it out like jello, put food coloring in it, just like the jello we had when we were kids or <laughs> on those not too many hospital stays. But that's what the seaweed salad you get in a sushi, and most sushi bars are. This is what a seaweed salad should look. This has three kinds of seaweed in it and seaweed in the dressing. It's an Irish themed dressing. It's simple and you can make it with any medley of vegetables and you add such a pop of nutrition. Underutilized species, I think probably everybody has noticed the last few years we can actually dip squids off the docks under the lights. That still amazes me. The first time I saw them dipping squids under the lights like that was uh, in Manila Bay in the Philippines. And, I didn't think I'd see the day when we'd be dipping them up here, but using it with underutilized species in farming. There's two things here. I'm using an underutilized species, two of them actually, if you include the cranberry. And also, that's a juvenile squid, uh, um, juvenile kelp off of one of the farms. 
And in the wild, you wouldn't want to try to harvest wild beds, harvesting the juveniles. You just wouldn't get enough biomass from it. But on the farms, you actually get better growth if you go out and pick what are some really prime small vegetables, like the baby spinaches that you see in the grocery store that they charge twice as much for. Dessert. First thing you think of when you think about seaweed, right? We make a puree that goes into, into batters like this that gives a nice little umami pop hidden in the background and it adds the nutrition. And this is where I'll mention to talk about the dietary fiber. Two separate studies, both preliminary studies, but one in Great Britain and one in Japan have concluded that the marine fiber in seaweed is 75% more efficient at removing bad fat. So we're talking about some guilt-free dessert here. That we're going to be able to sell. And actually, we already are. We make a fudge now that we do at shows. And people just, that's seaweed? That's not seaweed. I've gone to John, down to Johnson & Wales probably a couple times. Johnson & Wales University, they invite me down to their food labs and to, uh, to teach classes and do this down there. And the kids down there are amazing. And this is one of the places I go to help work up new ideas when I run out of, out of ideas for food. Part of the beauty of this is working under the CNET, EPSCoR, C Grant, and all these different programs. I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of college level students who are really getting interested in this. The next, the next iteration of this, what we're going to see with the next go round with the seaweeds, is going to be incredible. And this is part of it right here that I absolutely love. This is Long Island in Casco Bay. This year we put this farm in for the kids the third year in a row. It's just a little miniature farm for the grade school kids. And this is the third year in a row that we've run this farm. Now, talk about getting it into the future. When I was in grade school, they certainly didn't teach me this. And they didn't take me out on a boat and show me a seaweed farm. And they didn't let us grow a seaweed farm all winter and then eat it. They just harvested last week. And they'll be having seaweed all week this week. This one I like a lot, too, because this is Shabig Island, and they only ran their farm one year. They just didn't have the, it just wasn't as practical in their location where their farm is. But Shabig Island is where I put the first Bangs, mussel, Bangs Island mussel rafts in. And there was a lot of opposition to aquaculture. There still is opposition to aquaculture. And that's part of what I mentioned earlier about site selection being so important when you go for sites. It, and one of the advantages of people putting sites in closer to home, you know the people, you know everybody else out there that's fishing. When I go out in Casco Bay, I know the boats, even in a crowded harbor like that, it makes it easier to get the right sites. But this is Shabig Island, and now there's aquaculture all around the island and a lot less opposition. As a matter of fact, the islanders have started jumping in, which was the whole idea from the first place. This isn't actually a seaweed farm, this is an oyster farm, and we just put a little patch in for the kids.